What is up, everyone? It is Spada del Signore. Shabbat Shalom. God bless you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In today's video, I'm going to be giving you guys my review of the Mishnah. So it took me probably six or seven months to read through this whole thing. I mean, it's a, it's a beast of a book and the pages aren't exactly very, uh, you know, short. They're really long and complicated, and there's a lot of the theoretical legal situations, and it's really hard to comprehend. So it took a very long time for me. But basically now I just want to give you my thoughts on it, share with you some interesting passages I found, some really disturbing ones that I found, and hopefully this will help you talk with your Jewish friends. Now, obviously, maybe some of your Jewish friends are reform or uh, more on the liberal end, and so they probably don't even care about this stuff. So this is more for people who are conservative or orthodox because they really take the, the Mishnah to heart as a part of their uh, tradition. So to go over what the Mishnah is comprised of, it's comprised of these topical tractates or, or orders. So the first one is on agriculture, the second one is on holidays, third one's on different things involving family like divorce and marriage. Uh, the next one is on damages like tort law basically like if you like steal something or damage something. The next one is on sacrifices and the different types of sacrifices and the procedures for those sacrifices. The next one is on purity so um, this one was like really kind of hard to understand because there were all these different woulda, shoulda, um, not woulda, shoulda, couldas, but they were like um, uh, the theoretical situations, like if a bug dies inside of an oven that has a sealed lid and it's in a room with earthenware stuff and there's an upper room above. So a bunch of really kind of confusing Thing. Or like if a corpse is in a, in a room and this is the layout of the house, what needs to be cleaned and stuff like that so really kind of hard to understand and then that's it so it's topically organized and it they kind of related to each other pretty decently which made it a little bit easier to understand because knowledge in one of the um one of the chapters kind of led to knowledge in the other but for me the stuff with uh un uncleanness was really just hard to understand because they they believe that cleanness kind of just like it like shoots up through to the sky and down to the earth below in certain instances so really kind of not something that we typically think of or is in our cultural consciousness but to just do a big surface level thousand foot view the mishnah had a lot of interesting things in it I thought the history was really cool when they would talk about different things about what would happen in the temple or what would go on at the in the times of like Ezra, uh, different things like that, more like anthropological stuff, I would say. Now, one thing I would say is before, um, before reading the Mishnah, I, I didn't think that, uh, I didn't think that Jewish law was as crazy as it is but after reading this i admit yeah it's pretty crazy uh and just to be clear the mishnah is just the oral law compiled at like 200 a.d is right what it says here the talmud builds on that mishnah and is a commentary on it with some other stuff so a lot of the stuff that i found in the mishnah is found in the talmud but the talmud obviously build on it in uh, some crazy ways, but the root of it is still in the Mishnah. So uh, I, I'd say overall, I was more disturbed than not. So I just have a couple examples of things that I want to go through with you guys. I kind of made some post-it notes when I was reading through it so that when it was time to go through it, we could see it. So this first one is in uh, Nedarim. And it is, um, I just call them verses, verse, verse seven. It's talking about vows. In the case of one for whom benefit from another is forbidden by vow and who does not have anything to eat, 
the one from whom benefit is forbidden goes to the shopkeeper and says to him, so and so vowed that benefit for me is forbidden for him and I do not know what I will do. After grasping his intent, the shopkeeper gives food to the one for whom benefit is forbidden. And then the shopkeeper comes and takes payment for the food from that one who spoke to him. So th for those who don't kind of understand, it's basically saying if someone, like if I vowed to my friend, like core, like my field is Corban to you, like um, I'm basically going to offer it to the temple or it's not, you know, you're not allowed to eat it. Um, basically, um, or so, or Corban, all of my money to you, like you can't have any benefit from my stuff. It's basically what he's saying. The, the guy who's, you know, basically stops from gaining any benefit from my stuff can go to the shopkeeper and tell him that. The shopkeeper can then give him that stuff and then ask me to pay for it, right? So inadvertently, I'm still vowing that I'm, uh, the, the vow still stands that I am not giving him any benefit, yet there is a, a transfer of money from me to the shopkeeper instead of from me to the guy. So it's like, it's almost like, vow laundering in a way like money laundering is you take your dirty money or money you're not allowed to have and like make it clean so you're basically laundering your money through the shopkeeper even though you said you'd vow not to um provide any benefit to the guy so it's interesting because it's like when jesus talks about when the uh when the son says you know korban any benefit you would have from me uh, basically saying i'm giving it to the temple anything you should should have gotten from me jesus says you know the pharisees or maybe certain a group of pharisees said that was fine it, it, in a certain way too um you have these kind of workarounds with your vows so that was really interesting to me to see kind of that in action the next one is in um avot so this is kind of a little chapter talking about um, wisdom and stuff from the fathers. This one in 13 was interesting. It says, um, actually, no, it was 14. Um, so Shimon said, be careful with the reading of Shema and the prayer. That's the, um, like the, uh, oh, what's it called? Um, like the Amidah and things like that. So that like, um, that longer prayer, it's like 13 prayers long. Um, so those are the two main prayers in Judaism, uh, at least at the Mishnaic time. Uh, and when you pray, do not make your prayer something automatic, but a plea for compassion before God. In my version of the Mishnah, which I got on Amazon, it says, uh, make not thy prayer a fixed form. So kind of like when Jesus says, don't, um, you know, do these long kind of repetitious uh, prayers or things that are vain, rep repetitions, right? So that was interesting. And then the other one I found was really interesting was uh, Rabbi Tarfon said, the day is short and the work is plentiful and the laborers are indolent or idle and the reward is great and the master of the house is insistent. This is just like when Jesus talks about ask the master of the harvest and, um, you know, that the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. It sounds exactly, oops, sorry. It sounds exactly like uh, what Jesus is talking about. So I, I found that to be really interesting too. The next one that I wanted to show you guys, this is in uh, Horayot. So this is um, in regards to um, different things uh, regarding the temple and also um, things involving uh, gradations of people. So if you go to eight, a priest precedes a Levite. A Levite precedes an Israelite. An Israelite precedes a son born from an incestuous or adulterous relationship, mamzer. And a mamzer precedes a Gibeonite. The other word they use is a, a natin. And a Gibeonite precedes a convert. And a convert proceeds an eman emancipated slave. Isn't that so interesting? So the Mishnah grades people. So if you convert to Judaism, like, for example, let's think of like Ruth in the, in the story. You know, she was a Moabite and she converted to Judaism, right? She is just better than an emancipated slave. 
she's worse off than a, a, a Gibeonite, worse off than a, um, an Israelite uh, or a child born of an incestuous or adulterous relationship. So you're like the second worst thing ever. But yet the Torah talks about um, loving, uh, loving the converts, right? Loving the, um, loving the ger, the, you know, foreigner. Yeah, a convert, someone who actually takes on Torah and follows um, the God of Israel is like almost the worst class of, of people. In, in normal society, obviously, a slave would be lowest of the low, but just in regular Israelite society, being a convert is the second worst thing that you could be. So really kind of eye-opening kind of how it almost reminds me of the the status of dhimmi in, in islam that you're kind of a second class citizen if you take if you pay the tax you're protected no one's gonna hurt you in an ideal situation but um you're still second class okay next one i wanted to show you guys was in um Bechorot. now this one is involving um <laughs> this was kind of like funny to me but it was just kind of like wow it's talking about all the different things that disqualify someone from being a, a priest in the temple so it was just previously talking about animals that are unfit to be sacrificed and it said one whose head is pointed narrow above and wide below one whose head is turn up like wide above and narrow below one whose head is hammer like um and one whose head has an indentation one where in the back of his head protrudes um, and with regard to those with humpbacks, Rabbi Yehuda deems them fit for service and the rabbis deem them disqualified. When it says the rabbis, it means the sages. Um, talks about um, if you're bald, you can't. Um, Kere'a means like you're bald. Uh, but if you have hair going from one ear to the other ear, that, that's good. Um, your eyebrows are so long that they lie flat and cover his eyes. Um, Harum, um, Harum is like your flat eyed. Um, if you can look at the upper store in the ground floor at the same time, so if your eyes are kind of like lopsided, if you don't have your eyelashes, you can't be a priest due to um, the appearance of a blemish in mine. It says due to his unsightliness. If your eyes are too big or too small, that disqualifies you from being a priest. Um, if your upper lip juts out or if your lower lip juts out, um, that disqualifies you. And then it lower, it talks about if you're too pale or if you're too dark. But this one is like bow-legged. Uh, let me see where the one is about the... Oh, yeah, that, that's in um, verse 6. Um, yeah, dwarf, mute, you can't be... Um, First the one, so it's in six. Talking about it's after the after the fingers. Um, oh yeah, here it is. Concerned the cushy, like a cushite, someone who's like really dark. Uh, gihor, I don't know what gihor. I think gihor means someone who's red, and then lavkan is like an albino. So if you're an albino, or you're too dark. You can't you can't serve in the temple. It's really kind of interesting because if God made you that way, how can it be? You know, a blood machine. And it's not even that you have like a disability of some kind, it's just the color of your skin. You know, functionally, there's no difference between you and any other person. It's just the shade of your your skin. Really kind of odd and doesn't, I feel, reflect who the God of Israel is. Because like in, I forget if it's First and Second Samuel, it says men look at the outward, but the Lord looks at the inner. Now, I understand for animals and things like that, that you have to be, you know, perfect and without any kind of blemish of any kind. But skin color isn't a blemish, you know. Anyway, the next one is really disturbing for me. Uh, the Mishnah talked a lot about um, things involving childbirth and uncleanness due to childbirth. But it also, to my shock and horror, talks about... Um, Live birth abortion. All right, so uh, this is number seven. 
if a no it's six i'm sorry if a woman is having trouble giving birth they cut up the child in her womb i'm sorry this is like not safe i should have said this is not safe for children they cut up the child in her womb and bring it forth limb by limb because her life comes before the life of the child but if the greater part has come out one may not touch it for one may not set aside one's per, one person's life for that of another in my version it says um if the greater part of it was already born, it may not be touched. So guys, even, even if, you know, the head comes out a little bit, but there's still, so it's like you kill the, kill the kid. And that was just so shocking for me because, um, and I understand that there were no C-sections and stuff at this time, but to me, it just, it's just was so, uh, the Mishnah just is kind of disturbing and just how cold it seems. It just seems very cold and just very, uh, very disturbing. There were other things I didn't add um, about like if, you know, a woman miscarries and if um, someone, um, you know, depending on what stage of development it, it is, basically treating it like, like nothing. So it's interesting because in the Tanakh, God talks about saying, I formed you in your mother's womb like I knew you before you existed. And we know now that people in the womb, met, um, like little babies, can breathe. And that was one of the things that made Adam a living soul, is that he could breathe. He had the breath of life. So we know now, and I'd say Tanakh teaches that babies in the womb are alive. But the Mishnah kind of just treats them as this kind of like substance that they're not even really anything until 40 days. And even then, even like up until the point of birth, if they, if someone punches you and, you know, it's nine months, it's like, it doesn't count as anything. And I realize that in the Torah, it, it, um, it says that there's no penalty for it necessarily that like someone will... Um, be put to death because you obviously at, at that point you can't ascertain whether it's living or 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 dead but i i feel like the tanakh principle would be because it's life for life so if you can establish that um it is a life that would necessitate that the law of the um not being like a um a death penalty for you know making a woman miscarry i think that would be uh, subsumed I would be it was be, I haven't looked up any of the rabbinic commentaries on that because most orthodox Jews are against abortion and they don't view it as just this clump of of cells which kind of the Mishnah kind of puts forth in a way so interesting debate on that but I thought that was pretty disturbing next one is in uh Negaim talking interestingly I put this one as like the um Hebrew Israelite refutation verse. It talks about leprosy. And so on a German, uh, it appears as dull white. And the dull white spot in Ethiopian appears as a bright white. Rabbi Ishmael says, The children of Israel, may I be atonement for them, are like boxwood, neither black nor white, but of an intermediate shade. So that was really interesting to me because this is kind of anthropological uh, evidence and proof that you know the Israelites they're not black and they're not white they're in between but you have these um, Hebrew Israelites saying that the Israelites were black right I mean Ethiopians are are decently light-skinned but Ethiopians are considered you know black by by the Mishnah and so the rabbi is saying that they're not black or white. They're not German. They're not Ethiopian. They're in the middle. And it's funny because it, it already said that a Kushite can't even be a, a a priest because they're too dark. Yet the Africans, they would the, the ones who are Hebrew Israelites, they would say that they are the real Israelites. Yet the Mishnah says they wouldn't have even been allowed to be a priest because they're too dark. A Kushite is like a is like a African, right? Like a like a real African, someone who's dark. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. That would be a good proof against against them. And then the last one I included, guys. This is in 
Um, nida, this is in regards to marriage. This is the other one I'd say, keep the kids away. Um, a girl who is three years old and one day, three years and one day old, whose father arranged her betrothal is betrothed through intercourse. Okay. And then it goes down and says about before that, um, if the girl is less than that age, three years old and one day, the status of intercourse with her is not that of intercourse in all halakhic senses. Rather, it's like placing a finger into the eye. So it's basically saying that like if that happened to a child younger than that age, it's just like poking them in the eye. It doesn't like render them like not fit for marriage or like not a virgin. So obviously you can see how disturbing this is and how against Tanakh this is. You know, the Muslims, you know, Muhammad's example was nine years old. This is worse than that, three years old in a day, right? And I realize that in Islamic jurisprudence, like this would totally be acceptable. There's nothing stopping someone from uh, marrying a three-year-old, right, and doing that. But in, in obviously in Tanakh and the New Testament, we have all of this talk about mercy. And then especially in Tanakh, God gives the example in, I believe it's in Ezekiel, talking about when to marry a woman after puberty. I think it's Ezekiel 16. I'm not sure on that. But you don't get from reading the Tanakh that you can marry a three-year-old so it's, it's kind of just like what Jesus talks about. Like you um, strain a gnat and swallow a camel. This is the camel, guys. A three-year-old, guys. I mean, so a three-year-old can't even, can't even do basic chores or anything. Can't even take care of themselves. And you're, it, so super disturbing, obviously. So that's just been my experience with the Mishnah. Some interesting tidbits that, I feel like they copied from Jesus uh, and just other ones that are just so disturbing. And just to end this guys, the, the one thing that I found really interesting and not all Jews believe this, but there really is no, and I don't think I even included it in this. There's no penalty when an Israelite kills a Gentile, murders a Gentile. There's none. Doesn't the 10 commandments say thou shalt not murder? But to them, that just means Israelites, not not Gentiles. So anyway, guys, that, that's basically it for this video. I hope you were or, um, edified that we have the truth and that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and that we don't have to uh, be under the authority of these people. Um, so, and I'll also include in the description, the link to the uh, book on Amazon. It was like $60, I think, but, um, it was, it's just good to have it as a copy so I can, uh, have a physical thing that I can share with people. But that's it for this video, guys. God bless you all in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Spada del Signore. Out.